a strong young man rings the bell at 31 Lincoln Place, the residence of George Shippey, the redoubtable chief of Chicago police. The maid, recorded as Teresa, opens the door. The door certainly creaks ominously. Scans the young man from his soiled shoes up to his swarthy face and smirks to signal that he had better have a good reason for being here. The young man requests to see Chief Shippey in person. In a certain German accent, Teresa advises him that it is much too early and that Chief Shippey never wishes to see anybody before nine. He thanks her, smiling, and promises to return at nine. She cannot place his accent. She is going to warn Shippey that a foreigner who came to see him looked very suspicious. The young man descends the stairs, opens the gate, which also creaks ominously. He puts his hands in his pockets, but then pulls his pants up. They are still too big for him. He looks to the right, looks to the left, as though making a decision. Lincoln Place is a different world. These houses are like castles, the windows tall and wide. There are no peddlers on the streets. Indeed, there is nobody on the street. The eye-shaded trees twinkle in the morning drabness. A branch broken under the weight of ice touches the pavement, rattling its frozen tips. Someone peeks from behind the curtain of the house across the street, the face ashen against the dark space behind. It is a young woman. He smiles at her, and she quickly draws the, cur the curtain. All the lives I could live, all the people I will never know, never will be, they are everywhere. That is all that the world is. The late winter had been gleefully tormenting the city. The pure snows of January and the spartan colds of February are over, and now the temperatures are false-heartedly rising and maliciously dropping. The venom of arbitrary ice storms, the exhausted bodies desperately hoping for spring, all the clothes thinking of stove smoke. The young man's feet and hands are frigid. He flexes his fingers in his pockets, and every step or two he tiptoes as if dancing to keep the blood going. He has been in Chicago for seven months and cold much of the time. The late summer heat is now but a memory of a different nightmare. One whimsically warm day in October, he went with Olga to the lichen-colored lake, presently frozen solid, and they stared at the rhythmic calm of the oncoming waves, considering all the good things that might happen one day. The young man marches toward Webster Street, stepping around the broken branch. The trees are watered by our blood, Isidore would say. The streets paved with our bones. They eat our children for breakfast, then dump the leftovers in the garbage. Webster Street is awake. Women wrapped in embroidered fur collar coats enter automobiles in front of their homes, carefully bowing their heads to protect their vast hats. Men in immaculate galoshes pull themselves in after the women, their cufflinks sparkling. Isidore claims he likes going to the otherworldly places where capitalists live to enjoy the serenity of wealth, the tree-lined quietude. Yet he returns to the ghetto to be angry. There you are always close to the noise and clatter, always steeped in stench. There the milk is sour and the honey is bitter, he says. I'll stop here. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, why uh, Lazarus Auerbach? A story that has been, you know, it's it's an there, there have been a few books by historians here and there, but largely a forgotten story. The biblical Lazarus is more remembered than this particular young man, uh, you know, a, you know, poor Jewish immigrant who had only been in America for a few months and is killed at a very young age, 2021, and then largely forgotten. Um, you had been you had been in America for around a decade by the around the time you started uh, thinking about the novel, and this was also like a, just a couple of years after 9/11. Uh, um, was that, or was there something else? Well, actually, I, I came upon the story of Lazarus in about 2000. Someone gave me a book about the whole Lazarus affair, Lazarus Averbu affair. Where you know the Lazarus Adobu was shot by the chief of police of Chicago in 1908, March 2nd, at his doorstep, and um, the chief of police said that as soon as he saw him, he knew he was an anarchist because um, he looked Sicilian or Jewish. He was dark-skinned, in other words, and so 
Um, and that was interesting to me. This was before 9-11. And one of the interesting things was, the most interesting things is in, in this book that I read, in An Accidental Anarchist, which was a, a straight up historical account of what happened in 1908 with some questions unanswered, um, were the pictures uh, of Lazarus, and you'll see some of them here, um, including the, the pictures related to the case, which were in the book, including the pictures of Lazarus sitting dead in a chair with a policeman standing behind him and holding him up. Um, and uh, th those are the most haunting pictures I've ever seen still, and, and, and I started thinking about not only the story of Lazarus, the story of an immigrant who es he escaped, he had survived a pogrom in Kishinev, the famous pogrom of 1903. There was another one in 1905. Um, and to end up in the United States and then to be killed um, by the chief of police. If maybe you could get rid of this. I don't know why this is. Uh, maybe there's a chief of police in the, in the audience, a chief of police who objects to my representation of police. Uh, and sabotaging this. In any case, he survived um, the pogrom, and the story in which a survivor of the pogrom goes to the, you know, the land of milk and honey, the United States, and then is shot by the chief of police, seemed to me to be exposing, or at least addressing, an untold story of immigration in the United States, because the, the great narrative of immigration in America is that immigrants came as kind of half-humans, full of potential, but which they had not been able um, to fulfill in their native land, and then they bloomed into being Americans, whereas I've always known, not only because of the complicated relationship I have with America, but also because I've known a lot of immigrants, um, that the story was always far more complicated than that. Um, and so I, this was the initial interest. The pictures, um, I instantly started thinking of the ways in which I could include pictures into the book, um, and then Velibor uh, entered the picture, and um, some of my book contains um, some of these pictures, both contemporary, the ones he shot, and also archival pictures. But then 9-11 happened, and then uh, the rabbit um, nationalism was um, well awake in America after that, and all kinds of racism and anti-Muslim sentiment that is now, you know, carrying Trump and his troops uh, to the far horizon of the American elections. Uh, and then it became even more interesting. And then, in 2004, if you might remember, some of you might remember, some of you might not, but uh, the pictures from Abu Ghraib, the, the prison in Iraq that American troops used for torture and random torture, in addition to the organized torture of the CIA, the so-called enhanced interrogation, they tormented tortured prisoners and then took pictures of that. And the pictures were released in 2004. I had already gone to uh, uh, Eastern Europe to research for the book, and he took a lot of pictures. But the pictures from Abu Ghraib, some of them were structurally identical to the pictures of Lazarus Averbuch and the chief of police behind him, except they were American soldiers and you know, prisoners, prisoners in Iraq. And so as I was writing the book, it was acquiring a meaning that I had not uh, they have not been available to me initially, but this is what you do in writing. You follow your hunches, as it were. You go in the direction where it might take you, and then, you know, the history organizes itself, as it were, around the narrative. Uh, on, on pictures, I, I mean, that, that's a, he, he raises an important uh, thing about how there was echoes of uh, the pictures from Lazarus Auerbach's pictures with the Chicago police uh, dressed in that suit and being held up on a chair and the American soldiers in a book. How did you read those pictures? And, and seeing those, uh, you know, your, did your pictures change after, you know, you guys talked about all these meanings of what photographs are or what their relationship with politics is? Well, first, uh, I just also would like to thank everybody uh, for being here. This is really amazing. Uh, and for inviting a photographer to such an event. It's a bit intimidating <coughs> to speak to all these writers and readers. Uh, when we went for this uh, research trip to Eastern Europe, we really, that, that was before the Abu Ghraib pictures. So th that reference did not exist at that time. And uh, and it, it also also came uh, very early into my 
photography career. I, back then, in 2003, I was a I was uh, just for a few years immigrant myself from Sarajevo. Uh, I came to live in Montreal in Canada and I worked as an engineer and photography was just something that I did on the side and after showing some of these pictures to so Sasha he invited me to, to join him for this trip and work on this story. So. Uh, yeah, so that's how it started, and, and I remember the first time he spoke about it, he, he showed me these pictures of Lazarus. And up to that point, me being just, you know, uh, just taking pictures for myself, it really changed the way I, I, I looked at pictures and it started interacting with pictures and taking them really more seriously. It was not anymore just about a nice frame or... A, whatever pretty pictures, it was something else, that this, this ability of telling stories through images or influencing stories and the context around them with images. So that, that's how it started, but that was well before Abu Ghraib images. Right. But, but also the, the, the journey that you make, and, and uh, you know, here's, a, here's an ex excellent website and, and you can see some of those pictures here, which I mean, you know, a world is war and that's, you know, violence at its extreme. But there's also this desolate, desolate and like really bleak landscape, various corners of Eastern Europe that, that you, you pictured very, you photographed very well. Uh, and then going back to Sarajevo, where you were, you know, uh, Alexander uh, Hamon wasn't there. Uh, he, had, he, had, he was in Chicago around the time of the war, but you were, you were in Sarajevo when the siege was happening, and you fought with as a, as, a, as a soldier in the Bosnian army. You defended Sarajevo, and going back as a as with a camera and taking pictures. What was it like returning to the streets where you fought to save your city, uh, and then with the camera? What changed? Uh, well, that was my uh, actually. I uh, I left Sarajevo in 1998, two years after the war ended. And this was my first trip back home, uh, and this time with a camera in a, in a completely different context. And uh, first we went to Poland and Ukraine and Moldova, and on our way back, we ended up in Sarajevo. But it was, uh, it was very interesting to see that world. I mean, we, we come from Bosnia, but myself, I, I've never been to Eastern Europe before, even though people probably, they, they think we, that was our, our region, but we, Yugoslavia was kind of a different place, so we were traveling west. So I've never seen Ukraine or Poland or Moldova, and this was the first time. And also 2003, that was really early, still very early into this transition from socialism and communism into capitalism. Uh, and uh, this transition was so obvious and it, it, was, it was really ruthless, you know. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was really hard on people, on most of them. Uh, very few of them were getting filthy rich and uh, the rest, it was obvious, were very struggling. But also the, the way the pictures came out because we were really on the move all the time. We were, if we were not being in a bus or a train, we would be walking. I think we walked 30, 40 kilometers a day, whatever city we were in. So, so, so the images were actually a kind of a made in, in, in really fast in a, in, a, in a movement all the time. And that somehow also spoke to this this whole whole world out there that was that was really transitioning and changing rapidly. We um, he made twelve hundred pictures. We and it was all black and white film, and no no flash. And we walked so much. I remember that at the end of the day, um, at some point, our Achilles tendons were swollen like ropes. I mean, you could you could not put your fingers around them because we walked and walked and walked and walked randomly those who was you know not, not some of them are not very big cities and they wouldn't we had some maps but we wouldn't know and we all walked all over Kishinev or Chisinau today in, in Moldova in so many unpredictable directions and all the time he was he was shooting um, early on because we didn't really know how the pictures would work and what kind of pictures we needed there was a series of pictures that we or experimenting with where I would stand in for, for Brick, the, the main character. Yeah. 
but yeah, I would be only recognizable from behind because I had a Liverpool uh, football club uh, shirt with the name McManaman on the back and number, number seven. Uh, there was a little, a little reference there. But so we would stage this big, not stage, but I would go somewhere and he would take a picture of me from behind because I was considering the possibility that the pictures would comply with the narrative and I would put the character in the same situations. But they didn't work out for a number of reasons. Then there was another series of pictures and some of them we thought, what would Rora, the character, you know, what kind of pictures would he take? And we'd, he tried to shoot in the characters they were. And that also didn't quite work uh, out. I, I, so, so you discussed, the, you know, the, one of the characters who travels with this Bostonian, the, 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 the fictional characters are also Bosnian, I mean, the, the, the writer and the talk. So did you, you had this sketch, so you, had, you already had Rora's character in mind, and, and then you debated, okay, if he would, how was that? I mean, well, I did tell you. Shoot as I, a fictional person. Uh, well, it didn't, it didn't work. <laughs> Those pictures didn't work, but we would, because I had the outline in my head, and you know, there would be the storyline of Lazarus Averbuch in 1908, and his sister trying to retrieve his body after he was shot, and sort of Antigone narrative. And there would be a contemporary storyline with two Bosnian characters, one of them a photographer, the other one uh, would be a writer who go to Eastern Europe trying to trace back the path of, of Lazarus. This was the rough outline, but we already had, I already had the characters and what they would be like. Um, that Rora would be you know, a storyteller um, and a liar too, and that he would have a different experience of the war, different from, from Debas, in that he would, have, you know, he would have been in a different unit. If you have to read the book too for those little differences. Um, so we would sit around and discuss, and not all the time, but you know, what, what would Rora see, or you know, try to be inside the book. And so the, but the picture that he took in the character didn't, didn't work. So at some point, I mean, in, once he printed 1,200 um, contact sheets for 1,200 um, uh, pictures, then we could pick through some of those pictures. And all the pictures that we liked were uh, not in the character, and none of them were with my, you know, McManaman in the picture. So basically everything you <coughs> tried to set up or stage or overthink, uh, it didn't end up in, in the project, but uh, it was mostly... What, what, what happened when I came back from that trip, I, I immediately... You had thousands of these images. Yeah, yeah. I had, I had uh, about 40 rolls of film uh, that I exposed, and uh, so I, I went immediately to make contact sheet. But what was interesting, you know, I, I've been already photographing at that point for uh, for for years, and uh, but then I would notice the images uh, on there that really I couldn't even remember taking them because usually I can I can remember any exposure when I took it or even why I took it some most of the times. But in this case, there were images as if really somebody else took them, something that I would never photograph myself. So, so somewhere, because we discussed so much about these characters for a month of this trip and, and you know, building them, it, uh, it really, uh, did this disappear? No. It, it really influenced the way, the, the way I photographed in some, in some, to some degree. And also, as you can see, I, I, there was always a plan to include archival photographs, including Lazarus, other book photographs. So I, I, we, I scouted websites. There's a particular website that contains uh, pictures from the archive of the Chicago Daily News between 1904 to 1936. And so the early part of that, they even included some glass plates. And some of those pictures are actually glass plates pictures before film existed, um, or at least was used in, in newspaper business. So then um, on top of 1,200 pictures, I was looking through another 1,000 pictures at least, trying to find, find you know, pictures that I could put in the book. Uh, one of the things that, you know, this, is, this journey has been a big sort of central to the book, but how, I mean, fundamentally you're a fiction writer. Could you not just look at some pictures from that region in Chicago and imagine it? What, what was the need to travel? And to travel with a friend and not to travel alone. Uh, well, I mean, uh, yeah. was, was there something that was scaring you? Were you afraid of something? 
just I, I wasn't returning to that region. It's closer home. You're also going back to Sarajevo. I, I, well, I wanted to, uh, well, I wanted to go there. I did not frankly think uh, when we, we didn't go there to find the truth about Lazarus because I knew that was not really available. But I wanted to um, develop a storyline of the two of them traveling. And so we, we essentially went for a trip to, in order to write the outline, for me to write, write the outline for the book, to write a script. And so we wandered around, wandered, you know, we wanted to go to certain cities, uh, including Chisinau and also uh, Lviv and Chernovets, um, which is a border city. Um, it's now in south western Ukraine on the border with Romania and Moldova, um, which is a strange, one of those Eastern European or European cities, but Eastern European cities that had, before World War II, had a, a number of people living in the same place, and, and Jews and, uh, and Germans and Russians and Czechs and all kinds of people. And then World War II wiped out those differences. Still, after because of the Holocaust and you know various fascist troops passing um, through that region, but to that day, to that when we were there in 2003, I went to talk to a, a person at the Jewish Community Center, and I said, I, in Ukrainian, I, I, I can speak a little Ukrainian. I asked him, you know, I would like to talk to you, and so he took us in and we sat down. And I said, all right, he said, what language would you like to talk in? And I said, what do you have? <laughs> and then he listed five or six languages that, that was, um, he was speaking. Now, I, I could read that in the books, but it's entirely different to meet someone who, who is himself a residue in some ways from times past. He was Jewish, his family survived miraculously the Holocaust, and he still spoke five of those languages, including, including German. It's a kind of thing, yes, we could probably track it down in the book, but it's entirely different when you see a person like that. His name was Chaim. His pictures is in, in this in this little film, and so I, someone I will always remember um, for the rest of my life. We will always remember. I remember his smell. He was a living human being, and he was a living uh, human being living in history, and that's an that's an important aspect of of writing of literature of, of history. In fact, thinking about history that it affects human beings and their bodies. That that you know, it kills people, which means it eliminates their bodies from from history. Would you like to read something from the trip, from the parts of the book where you travel? Trip, yes. Uh, Any of your favorite sections? Oh, uh, there are so many. I think I'll have to take a picture of this to prove to my family <laughs> that I actually did something in Jaipur. That's because this is a... Uh, yeah, they never believe. When we went to Eastern Europe, they didn't believe. Um, all right. So they, they, have a, they hire drivers, we did, to drive them uh, from one place in Ukraine to another. And in this story, um, Andre is a, is a driver. I paid Andre and wished him good luck on his way back, and thus he completed his purpose and exited this narrative. He had dropped us off at a hotel that called itself Business Center Bukovina. Its facade was freshly painted bright beige and implausibly raspberry. Implausible raspberry. The stairs leading to the entrance were red carpeted, but the carpet was filthy. At its low end, there lay a mangy dog who raised his head and sniffed the air when we passed, but it did not move. It appeared blind. Our room was on the fifth floor, and we climbed the stairs, hauling our luggage. On each floor, there sat a baba, an older chubby woman in blue cleaning personnel overalls, glaring at us as we passed. The last one stopped us with a grunt and called us over to her desk. On a sofa behind her, there three scantily clad women sat with their legs identically crossed, flashing their mini-skirted thighs. They were looking at us unblinkingly, assiduously, as though about to utter a prophecy, and then the one in the middle, lippy and large-eyed, winked and said, hi. Somehow, she recognized us as Americans, and we recognized them as prostitutes. We signed something for the barber, and she handed us she handed each of us a slim roll of pink toilet paper, apparently rewarding us for overcoming all the obstacles and successfully reaching the fifth floor. The room smelled of my grandfather's death, a malodorous concoction of urine, vermin, and mental decomposition. When I turned on the lights, a host of cockroaches scurried radially from the center of the room, marked by a stain on the carpet. The blankets on the beds were greasy, the sheets blemished and wrinkled. There was a small TV in the upper left corner. The walls were much too white, 
as though blood splatter had been whitewashed with quicklime. Aurora opened the window, which overlooked nothing but a gigantic garbage container brimming with glass bottles. Its sparkling fullness gave me a momentary pleasure. I always like to see a full garbage container, because I relish the thought of emptying it, the complete unburdening implicit in it. Do you know the joke, Aurora said, where little Muya asked his mother where children come from? And she says, well, I put a little bit of sugar under the carpet before I went to sleep, and the following morning I found you there. Little Muya puts a little bit of sugar under the carpet before he goes to sleep. The following morning he finds a cockroach and says, you motherfucker, if you weren't my brother, I'd smash you flat. I'll stop here. Oh, thank you. So, how do you, when you read this book, and there's this, there's these images. How do, you, so did you like, I mean, in, in the sense where you, when you look at the text, you know, things he has written after you've given him the final selection of the pictures. So, and they have been placed at different places in the book. And then when you look at it, how do you, how do you process it? Like. What is the text? Because I saw on your website too, there are, there are some pictures which have quotations from the book. So I was, I was just trying to understand. You know, because placing the pictures, that, that too must have been such a big struggle. And what it really means, is it always just related thematically to that point, or are you doing something else? Well, basically, uh, the, the process was uh, such that I first printed all the contact sheets, then I selected about 200 images that I printed, small prints, and that's what I passed to Sasha at first. Then that selection got down, and, and, uh, but the final, the final selection for the book, because at that point I did not know what the book is. I mean, I knew the story, I knew the characters, but I, I haven't read anything. So uh, it was actually Sasha who selected the first round of images that are going to go. He knew what the text is. He knew how the images would operate in it. And at the end, uh, you know, he showed it to me, and then we discussed it. And I, maybe I don't even remember. I had one or two suggestions, but uh, but uh, largely the selection in the book is uh, is uh, what came from Sasha. So uh, so. Yeah, it was very interesting, but the f very first time when I saw the, the s how do you call this copy before, that's not published yet, the uh, advanced the reading copy, advanced yeah. reading galleries, copy. Yeah. yeah, so it was actually my first time that I see the layout of the book and, uh, and the same image really uh, functions differently in different contexts. And, uh, and so, so the way I use images on the site, the way I use images in, in a little film, or uh, the way they are used in the book is very different. So, but uh, the, the final selection was for the book was mostly Sasha's. Well, when we, when we went to, uh, to Eastern Europe and I knew there would be images, and then he shot 400 pictures, I did not know exactly how the, the uh, pictures would be used in the book. Whether they, they would interrupt the text, how many pictures, you know, would there be a, a limit per chapter? And I didn't know how chapters would work, whether I had them numbered and whether they would alternate the, the story, the present time story or the past story. So in the process of writing, I used Velibor's pictures as notes. I don't write written notes, really. I don't use written notes. When we traveled, I made no notes at all. The pictures were the notes. So then I, I, I organized the narrative around the pictures. And it's not, it's not that I wrote the book and then put the pictures in, the very writing of the book required the pictures and picture taking to be, um, it, it was essential to, to, the, to the whole process. This was, again, it was, you know, we were figuring this out as we were going along. As before the, um, at least part of it, before the Abu Ghraib pictures um, came out. Now, you know, I, was, I have reason to believe that some of you have not read the book, but a contemporary story deals very much with that, you know, the 2000s in America, the post, not only post 9-11, but post Iraq invasion phase when this um, uh, American militarism and nationalism and, and fascism really, the, the, there's a full continuity between those times and Donald Trump now in the, in the United States. He's not, he didn't come out of nowhere. He's, he's Bush's younger brother. Um, and stupid too, which never, no, one, no one thought it was possible. <laughs> 
but um, but it deals with that in, in so so many ways, and so that um, it, it's a strange it's strange to me. I do it how a book comes about. The, the notion that you just think about it for a little while and then just sit and write it down and then polish it in various drafts, it really is not sustainable. It certainly was not does not work in this particular case. It was a uh, it was a process um, that dependent on some serendipity, but also it was really happening in history, if you wish. It was written in a particular time uh, where particular people, about particular people who lived in a particular time. And it's, a, it's both about history and it is history in and of itself. And in the current moment, I mean, you briefly mentioned Mr. Trump, but you know, I, mean, so I, was, I was recently looking at, at, at the novel again after a while. Has, have there been discussions? Has, you know, this, this whole, it's the same tropes of othering, you know, this is the, the ghetto, the othering, the marking, you know, the, the profiling, has in, in the recent days as kind of, uh, you know, the, the, the past few summers in America, where they, it comes with uh, the race question or now again with the question of marking a religious uh, minority. Yeah. Uh, uh, have there been new discussions around the book, or have you heard from people who are reading it in a different way? Well, I mean, people who read the book, you know, they, they might recognize um, the, the, the aspects of the book that pertain to this moment and the past. But the thing what I'm sad to report, um, for I think in what America and many Americans are not good at is thinking about history and in history and reflecting upon that. Because one of the <clears throat> consequences, or symptoms rather, of American exceptionalism that is that you can accept yourself not only from all history but your own history that somehow you can will your way out of history individually and as a nation so that one day you decide effectively we're done with racism and then there presumably there's no racism except it is everywhere but this <clears throat> inclination to just will your, uh, to believe that willing yourself out of history is possible leads to particular blindness uh, to, which is fascinating to me. It's very hard to think and write in that context because, <clears throat> I mean, the book did pretty well, but I think that um, it was difficult for many Americans uh, to see what's in the book and what the book says about the conditions of being American because the contemporary story particularly addresses that. The condition of being American to me also means that you have to, one has to deal with a history of bigotry and racism, discrimination that was not exceptional and accidental, but it was so deeply embedded in the very construction of American identity that there was always had to be someone else who was either not American or less American so as to allow us, whoever we are on this side, to construct this identity. And this is what Trump is exploiting again, but this is, it's not a new method, it's, you know, just 10 years ago, in the Bush's times, the same thing was happening, it was just different actors. And then, you know, it was happening 100 years ago with Lazarus Averbrook. This is, I, I live in the United States, I have great fondness for many aspects of it, but the, what, this thing is not one of the things I'm, I'm very fond of. And so it's something that I have to fight against every day to operate, but also something that, stimulates me um, and makes me want to write books that, that address that. And that, you know, does not necessarily result, result in great sales. But when my daughters read my books, or if they don't read my books, if they ask me, what did you do in the early 2000s? What did you think about all that? Then I can point in this book and say, this is what I thought. And, you know, on, on the question of America, again, I mean, your new book, uh, your new novel, which is, uh, recently come out, it has a very, very American title. It's a, I don't know if it's a Tell American. us a bit about it. What about American it? Obsession with Zombies. I never thought I'll see that in an Alexander Hammond title. <laughs> the book is called The Making of Zombie Wars, um, because the main character is a screenwriter who's writing a script for zomb uh, 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 an imaginary movie, imagining that he'll, he'll, he'll never get, made, get it made, because he's not very good at it. Um, it's about a screenwriter who's writing a script entitled Zombie Wars. Um, and so it takes place at the time of the Iraq invasion, the exact two week, week, first two weeks of the Iraq invasion in Chicago. And so he gets in, it's supposed to be funny, it's, it's funny to me and many other people. Um, 
but it's it, it's set at a particular historical time and and it deals with some of the things that I've just talked about, but um, in a funny way, I hope. Thanks. And are there any new projects for you? Are you thinking of more collaborations? Yeah, well, uh, I, I always like to tell a story, like to, to summarize my, my, my life. In 1984, we were, I was 18 years old, Sarajevo had the Olympic Games. It was, you know, we, the future was not our concern whatsoever. Just 10 years later, I was already a two-year war veteran. The whole world around me collapsed. My friends scattered all over the world. Ten years later, I've already been working for five years as engineer in some faraway Canada and, uh, you know, on a different continent at a place I really didn't know much. And then ten years later, I, I, I have a Master's of Fine Arts and I'm making a living as an artist. So all this to say that it's really so unpredictable, your life. So. But now I'm, I'm kind of starting going back and I recently did a project called My Prisoner that deals with a specific situation that happened during the war where my father was the prisoner of the same army that I was uh, drafted for and uh, at one point uh, in the war the, the people above decided that it would be a good idea that they allowed me to visit my father for a few minutes so they could film this and make a little propaganda piece. Just like any other images produced in any war are really just propaganda images. So 18 years later I, uh, I retrieved this, this archival footage and I did a little uh, video installation and, and a little film. So that was the latest thing. Thank you. We also, if I may say so, we, we, we have this idea we want to work on together because um, we talked about it for years and applied to some grants and then it was never the right time to do it and now we think it's the right time and the idea is that we want to interview Bosnians wherever they may be um, and they are everywhere in the world including here somewhere I'm sure uh, and ask them how did you get here to have these narratives of people's arrival or departure and arrival and so we, we, we were in Paris recently at the same time. We talked to some people there and took pictures there. Now we want to, um, you know, keep working on that. Um, there's a guy I know in, in Japan who's in, a member of an anarchist collective. There, there's, I have family in Australia and Italy. Uh, we'll talk people in Canada, United States, uh, in, in people in Europe. And to collect, um, we would collect stories about their lives, about their transitions, about their migration. We, we thought this was the right time because of um, migrants and immigrants and refugees being at the, uh, in the focus of, of the public eye, the global public eye for the past couple of years. On, on, on the, now that you, you're thinking about Sarajevo, some of the passages in the, in the novel you know, have stayed with me for years and I love them to the dearest, is when you write about Sarajevo, you know, back on those streets. Could we wrap it up with just a short reading from your, when you go, when you arrive in Sarajevo? Any of those parts? Okay. Um, yes. Before we reached Sarajevo, I had to pass through a world of pain. Um, they beat up a pimp, <laughs> the characters in the book, and so the narrator broke his hand while beating up a pimp. All night long, my hand had been throbbing, and I could feel it create, um, getting dullier until it felt like it belonged to someone else. Most of the train ride to Belgrade, Rora smoked outside a sleeping compartment we were sharing. Then he slept on the bus to Sarajevo. It was as though he had, he had said to me everything that could have been said, all of his statements completed. Only as the bus was descending into the great Sarajevo Valley, the city tucked under thick morning fog, did I dare ask him. If um, then there's a little dialogue which I'll skip, He's, he might be shot in Sarajevo. I will not tell you what happens if you haven't read the book. By the time we arrived at the bus station, my hand was shades of indigo and swollen as though it belonged to a corpse. Laura would not let me take a cab from the bus station to the hotel. Instead, he insisted I walk with him to the city hospital where his sister was working, but a few painful minutes away. 
Lawrence insisted strenuously that his sister must look at my hand. Perhaps he was feeling that the whole uh, pimp affair was somehow his fault. While I, deranged by steady pain, kept saying everything would be all right. I could not forget the sweet sounds of the pimp's face cracking. My pain was well worth it. Rhoda carried my bag as I cradled my broken hand. Walking with him down a Sarajevo street named after a dead poet was a wholly uncanny experience. Everything was as I remembered it, yet entirely different. I felt like a ghost. People passed by without glancing at me. I was fully unexceptional and insignificant, if not perfectly invisible. I recalled my previous life, the life in which I had ridden a bike down this very street and where the kids on their way to school pelted me with rocks. The life in which I had written some politically charged obscenities on the school wall. The life in which I had effortlessly stolen candy from a store minded by a blind old man who had stubbornly denied his blindness to himself and to others. Nobody seemed to remember me. Home is where somebody notices your absence. We walked past the hospital security guard watching a Latin American soap opera, went up the staircase. The elevator was out of order, teeming with patients smoking in washed out pajamas, and found um, Rhoda's sister's office at the end of a long tunnel-like corridor. Rhoda walked in without knocking, and I followed him, closing the door behind me with a foot like a proper thug. Thank you. Uh, I think we have time for a couple of questions. I hope so, yes. Thank you. Um, I'm just riveted and going to go get that book. Um, but the question is, if your next project, or a next project potentially is, how did you get here, wherever here is for each of those people, how did each of you get here, where you each ended up, Chicago and Canada? Um, Hey, did you hear the question? The question is how, how we, in our next project of talking to Bosnians, wherever they may be, how we get to here, to where they are. Well, it's mainly like this, <laughs> that, you know, um, I we go to festivals or, or end, end up no, having... I mean, how did each of you get oh, I, I see where how. you... Oh, yes. Here is for you. Yeah. Oh, I, I misunderstood the question. How did we get here? That's a very long answer, but... Um, Briefly, I was a young journalist before the war and I was invited to visit the United States for a brief period as a young journalist to, um, and traveled around. But this happened right at the beginning of the war and I was supposed to fly back to Sarajevo as the siege was closing. And so I decided to stay in Chicago, which is where I live now and where I work. And he will tell you his story. Yeah, well, uh, I... Uh I left Sarajevo in '98, so two years after the war, and it was very easy. Nothing, nothing like these refugees from Syria today have to go through. It was Canada at that time had some kind of program for Bosnians, and we applied and we got all our papers while still in Sarajevo, and we decided actually we're not even thinking about leaving me and my wife, and then then we got. We got our first child, and when our son was born, uh, we decided that we want to try somewhere else, and that's when we left for Canada. There's someone there. Um, hi. Hi. So, um, <coughs> this is a question for Bellevue, especially. Um, when you're taking a picture, um, as especially as a person uh, who takes pictures in your field of photography and as a former soldier, um, how important is context? Like, and how much do you strive to add the right context according to you to that picture? I'm not sure I could hear all of the all of the question. Can uh, can you repeat, please? Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, so especially in your field of photography and as a former soldier, um, when you're taking a picture, how much are you striving to add the right amount of context according to you? Because I, I believe context is very important when you're taking like photos on political issues. So how much are you striving to add the right amount of context like to your photos? Like how, how important is it? Well, you know, uh, I don't uh, actually work only with photographs. I worked with video installation and in different, use different means to tell different stories. So, uh, 
my, my life experience obviously play into everything I do at one point or another on different levels, but uh, it not necessarily has anything to do uh, with, with, uh, with Sarajevo or Bosnia or my experience in, as, uh, under the siege. So uh, I do projects that are really dealing with local stories in Montreal where, where none of this really has a, any importance, at least consciously. There's the Bosnian, yes. We'll ask you. Huh? It, well, he just spoke in, in our beautiful language and said, Good day. <laughs> And nice to um, see you, yes. Yeah. It, it happens so often to me, I cannot begin to tell you that when I, I go and read and speak somewhere that there's always someone, and very often someone I know and, or have not seen maybe for many, many years, they, they show up, this is the, you know, um, an aspect of a life in diaspora that, um, that I could get around. I mean, this separation, people being all over the world, that I can get around by virtue, by virtue of traveling. And it, it's, it's, in, it's at the same time a privileged situation and a, and a, and a mark of, of displacement. But thank you. Hvala. Uh, hi, thank you for your talk. I was wondering if you could say a few words about what it is like to write in a language that is not your native language, what the experience was like. The question was, if you didn't hear, what um, the experience is of writing, my experience of writing in a non-native language. He also writes uh, in English, but not as much as I do, because he does visual arts. Well, I write in both languages. I write in Bosnian too, and I, I, apart from a brief um, break in the mid-90s, when I also was not capable of writing in English, um, I've been writing in Bosnian and English simultaneously for the past 20 years now. Um, except I don't write fiction in Bosnian, um, and though there's no particular reason why not to do it, I just, I'm just not doing it. As of now, I, don't, I, I am not the one to talk about it perhaps, but I do not see any difference. I don't have a different mind, and I'm not a different person in those two languages because after 24 years of living in Chicago, much of my, most of my adult life, both of the languages are part of my subconscious mind and I don't have to exert any effort to generate text or speech in any of those languages. Um, however, there was a transitional phase in, the, in those years when I couldn't write neither in Bosnian nor in English, and where I remember um, the years of acquiring English as a writing language, I could speak some and, you know, omitting articles and making any a mistake, but I was well able to communicate. But in those uh, few years when I didn't write in English, when I was trying to acquire the language that I could write in, the register of language that is uh, um, appropriate for writing what I want to write, what I wanted to write, there was a, a time where I could sense that my subconscious mind was, um, uh, there was, it, it was imbued with the English language. There was, the, the language was entering my mind and that it was going to settle there. Uh, because to write in any language in, in this register, I think, you, and, uh, or to speak without thinking about what you're saying, um, you have, it has to be part of, the language has to be part of your subconscious mind. So in those days, as the English language is entering my subconscious mind, I would, for instance, notice in my dreams that the people in my dreams would speak English, and I found it strange in my dream. And then I remember the dream, I remember it still, um, because I woke up, the, the, the shock of recognition, of recognizing that people would, should not have been speaking English in my dream woke me up. I also remember, and this is perhaps even more strange, I uh, remember, remember, I re remember remembering in English, remembering things that would not have taken place in English, say the conversations between the two of us and we did not speak English to each other. We still don't, but we're certainly not in Sarajevo. Um, and so I was translating my memories, as it were, in English. 
and, and I was not willing this. It was just, you know, as you wander around and you're reminiscing and things come, in your um, come up in your head, I caught myself remembering, remembering in English. And, and now, Frank, I do not know, I do not know this, what language I'm dreaming in or what language I'm remembering in uh, either. And, and I can often, I do not, I get confused about languages that I, I'm speaking. That is, I can start speaking to him in English or to my parents. But I can also, you know, s separate them if, I, if need be. I can speak to Brazilian and him and then someone here in Jaipur addresses me in English and I switch to English instantly. So. It's not a different experience for me as of now, writing in English or Boston. It's just, it's different to the extent that I write different genres and different forms and different media involved and so on, but there's no inherent difference. Thank you so much.